Okay. Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody had a good fall reading week. Hopefully you got a little bit of time. Um, when, uh, before I get started here, just a couple of things. The first thing is remember your assignment four is due by the end of Friday. Keep in mind the 830 rule is in effect, just like the previous assignments. Um, and also another thing I do need to mention, this is something very important, is that course evaluations, there should be an email that you should receive. And so this is not on your courses, but an email that you're going to receive that will get you access to a form for course evaluations. It'll be open for a couple of weeks. Uh, so if you haven't received it yet, uh, you should receive it probably today. And uh, make sure you give your feedback. It's very important that we give back the feedback, whether it be about the course, uh, about how I'm doing with the course. Uh, this feedback is very important for the department and also for myself. Feedback is something I take very seriously and it always improves, uh, improves the kind of teaching I do. So I always take very deep and careful consideration of feedback. So that being said, uh, I'm just going to proceed with the next topic here. So I'm going to be shifting gears. So last day I finished up talking actually about graph algorithms. That doesn't mean we're going to stop talking about graphs at any point. There will be still points where I'm going to refer back to them. So if you really liked about the topic about graphs, we're going to talk about graphs later on in the course or sometimes it might pop up. It's just another modeling tool for us to talk about different problems. So now I'm going to be shifting into algorithm design techniques. So this is the part of the course that I thoroughly enjoy the most. So hopefully you'll get that impression. I'm one of these algorithms people. So I always have an obsession with these things. Uh, so hopefully that rubs off on you a little bit. So today we're going to be talking about greedy algorithms. Now, believe it or not, we've already been talking about greedy algorithms. Just I haven't given it a name yet. So what's a greedy algorithm? Well, a greedy algorithm what it's going to do is it arrives at a solution by making a sequence of choices. So each one of these is going to work you towards building a feasible solution for an optimization problem. But each one of these choices was simply the best choice. There may be multiple criteria for what that means at the time it was made. So you might say, Dan, that sounds really simple. And that's indeed what it is. It's very, it's a very simple idea. The whole idea is that I take my instance and every time I figure out some criteria, I'll usually call it the selection criterion. And based on that, I'm going to always pick an item or some part of the solution that I'm going to compute. So I'm going to take my problem instance. I'm going to do something based on this best choice I'm going to make. I'm going to include that in my solution. And the big thing is that when I look at the decisions I make at each stage, each time I do this, I have to make sure that the solution is feasible still with respect to the choices that I have made. So that when I'm finished making all my choices, I end up with a feasible solution. In certain circumstances, it will be the case that the algorithm will always produce an optimal solution. So let me just, just give you a couple of reasons why you might consider one of these types of algorithms. So just a couple of things I wanna point out to you. As the name and what I've described to you, this sounds really simple. Like all I do is I make one choice every single time and I do this and this will allow me to build some feasible solution, right? So I just gonna repeatedly do something over and over again based on this best choice. That's gonna be what I call the selection criterion. And every time I'm going to ensure it's a feasible solution. And then when I'm done building it, I, I have some way of knowing that some sort of solution check. So greedy algorithms have a typically, typically, typically are simple and easy to implement typically simple, and I mean that conceptually speaking. They're very simple usually to understand. And they're easy to implement. For some reason I wrote implication. Let me fix that. As you can see, it's a Monday. Uh, easy to implement. And are easy to implement. That's usually one of the features why somebody would come back 
and say, well, maybe I should consider taking a greedy approach with this. It's that oftentimes they're very simple, but here's the catch. Here's the catch. To prove correctness, so in this case, that means I'm always producing a optimal solution, is often not trivial. Meaning it's typically a little tricky to do this. So I'm hoping today I'll show you a way that you can. So it's a standard argument type of argument used for greedy algorithms called an exchange argument. So I'll be hopefully having time to show you this. If not, I have it in the notes uh, to give you an example of what one of these so-called exchange arguments is. In fact, in the notes previously, we actually seen an example of this, but I'll point that out in a moment. So we're going to focus when we talk about greedy algorithms, we're going to talk about those that exactly compute an optimal. So it means it's always going to work correctly. So that's what we're focusing on here today. But I must stress that greedy algorithms are very frequently used in heuristics. So if you don't necessarily care about computing the optimum, usually greedy approaches tend to be one of those ones that tends to work pretty good in practice. So if you find some greedy approach that makes sense for your problem, oftentimes it works pretty well, but not always, I warn you. Uh, on the next assignment, you'll see an example of such a thing. Uh, but my point here is that we're going to focus on exactly solving problems, not just saying, oh, it's kind of good. That's not good enough for us in this class. But I must also stress that there are ways to say, hey, look, a greedy approach actually works pretty good and it actually finds answers really close to an optimal sometimes. I must stress that that's also a thing that, that it does exist in a domain called approximation algorithms. That's an area I typically work in. Uh, so I must stress that uh, there is work that does this sort of stuff, but we're gonna focus just on computing an optimal. That's our goal here. So these can provide wonderful results, but be careful because they don't necessarily always work. <laughs> they may work terribly. So let me describe what a selection criterion is, and I'm gonna give you some examples. So, so some people like to call this the greedy criterion. I just call it the selection criterion because it tells you which selection you're making, the best choice. So, so it chooses the next, it chooses the next item to place the place in the solution based on a greedy criteria. Now you might ask, what the heck does greedy criteria mean? Usually in the context of this, this is another way of me saying locally optimal. So if I am looking at my choices that I can make, what I do is I typically pick the one that is the best possible choice that would minimize the answer or maximize the answer that I'm looking for, depending on what kind of optimization problem it is. I look at what I currently can consider and I figure out which one is the best one. Now there are many, there could be many definitions what locally optimal means. I'll give you a couple of examples of what I mean by this in a moment. So, you can think of this just as the best choice I could have make made at the time. So like, for example, if I go to the grocery store and say, for example, I'm looking for cheese and I want to go, go into the grocery store and get good deals on cheese. What I could do, for example, I could intuitively walk through the entire store looking for all the cheese and determining which one, for example, has like it, it does yield the least cost for me, but gives me the best value. I could do something like this, or I could go into the grocery store and it, what I do is I look at the first set of cheeses I see on display in the grocery store and I pick the one that is the cheapest one. Say for example, there's a deal. So what I do is I take all the ones that I see the deal on and I do this every single time. So do you see the difference between say a globally optimal, which would be the best possible choice given all of the information 
that I could potentially use or exhaust versus at that time, this is the best choice I could have made. So I'll give you some more concrete examples in a moment about this. So that is, it specifies, it specifies the best choice. So best, like I said, in quotation marks, the best choice, the best choice at the time it is to be picked. So one very important detail here is that we must ensure, sometimes this is straightforward, other times it's not so much. We must ensure at each step, we must ensure at each step of the algorithm, at the, of the algorithm, that a feasible solution Well, in particular, it's a feasible partial solution. So what does that mean? It just means that if I look at what at choices I've made up to this point, that what I'm saying is if I make my choices, when I look at my choices with respect to the items or choices that I've made from that instance, the items that I have considered, if I look at those in their own right with respect to an instance that only consists of those items, that is in fact a feasible solution. That's the technical explanation. The other way is just simply that every time I do this, I just want to make sure it follows the rules of the problem. Feasible partial solution is computed so far. Computed so far. So that the algorithm, or the, the algorithm produces a feasible solution, produces a feasible solution after all the choices. After all the choices. So I make a sequence of choices. And the idea is that as long as every single time it follows the rules of the problem for my choices that I've made, that at the end of this process, it has to be that it's also a feasible solution. So, so question asking, uh, does that mean that the greedy algorithm uses a greedy criteria at every step? Correct, correct. So you're gonna see a couple of concrete examples. In fact, you've actually seen at least a couple of greedy algorithms already. So, let me just give you a couple of examples. Let me just give you a couple of examples, and I'm hoping that this will give you a flavor for what I mean by a greedy algorithm. So let me give you a couple of examples of how the selection criterion is typically defined. When you actually tell me the selection criterion, usually you're telling me most of what the algorithm actually is. <laughs> That's the thing that makes them nice and simple. So here's an example. Uh, you've actually seen a couple of greedy algorithms already. So for example, Prim's algorithm is a greedy algorithm. So what's the selection criterion here? We select a least weight edge, a least weight edge, E, whose endpoints, whose endpoints, whose endpoints belong to a vertex, vertex S, which is gonna to belong to a set I'll call S. This is your cloud or blob. So S is the blob that we've talked about. Sorry, this should be U you right there to a vertex to a vertex v which is belongs to the set 
that doesn't contain any of the vertices that are in the blob. So the, the fancy way of writing this is the set of vertices set minus the set S. So this is all of the vertices not in the blob. And this is exactly what we did when we talked about Prim's algorithm, right? This is, remember we used that cut property, and this is what we did every time with Prim's algorithm. We select a least weight edge that takes, has one endpoint sitting in the blob, the other one is not in the blob. And then we include V in the blob every single time, right? So this would be the selection criterion for Prim's algorithm. This is one way you can cast it. Here's another example. The other day we seen Dijkstra's algorithm. And this time I will spell it correctly. There's Dijkstra. <laughs> My apologies, that's, that's very silly of me. Taught this enough times that I should know how to spell it uh, left and right, back and forward. Um, more of a slip of the hand, like when I write words and they sort of melt in the microwave. So Dijkstra's algorithm. Believe it or not, this is also a greedy algorithm as well. So here's a nice simple way of me describing it to you. So you select the next closest vertex to the source S that has not yet been included included in the blob or cloud, whatever you want to call it. In the blob or cloud, if you want to call it S, you can call it S like I did up here. But do you get a flavor for what I mean by the selection criterion? So this, so every single time I do this, this is always going to be the best choice that I could have made at that time. And the point here is that by making these best or locally optimal choices, I'm able to actually compute a globally optimal solution, meaning I end up with an optimum. So I end up with some optimal solution through this process. But notice that the way I described the selection criterion to you, that you could basically get the whole algorithm, right? So when I tell you Dijkstra's algorithm like this, you're like, Dan, that's really simple. Why didn't you just say that the other day? <laughs> And the answer is very simple, is that I wanted to walk you through the thinking process for designing an algorithm like Dijkstra's algorithm. That's the difference between me just spoon feeding you algorithm versus trying to teach you algorithms. But does everybody get the general gist of the idea? If not, I'm going to show you another example in a moment. So are we all okay with the idea of the selection criterion? So all your algorithm is going to do is it's just going to keep repeatedly using this selection criterion. And you get to decide that. If you pick a good selection criterion, you can actually make sure it computes optimal solutions. For some problems, that's simply not going to work. So you have to be very careful. Sometimes we rely on very special structure. So just to be clear, Always picking a locally optimal solution does not guarantee a globally optimal solution always. In fact, it leads you something. So somebody's asking, what is non-greedy? Well, notice that when I did these two, I say if I, for example, consider these two algorithms here. Notice here that every single time I tell you exactly what to include in the solution. Now, notice here, this is what's really important here, in Prim's algorithm, Notice that when I include a vertex in the blob, if I look inside that blob, I actually still technically, with respect to those vertices, I still have a spanning tree with respect to only those vertices in the blob. And you could also technically argue in those cases for more specialized structures, such as that it is a minimum spanning tree with respect to only those vertices. So when I do this every time, when I make that choice, it's not, I can't revoke it after the fact. So that's one thing that will very quickly tell you that there's algorithms that don't do this. So for example, you may have an algorithm that you make some choice, then you change your mind later on. That's the example of something that is not a greedy algorithm. Here, all I'm doing is I just apply this selection criterion over and over again until I end up with a feasible solution. 
It's a very simple idea. There's going to be many algorithms that do not fit this pattern. So just as an example, when I went to the grocery store in my hypothetical scenario, when I told you that the best way I could have done is I looked at all the cheese, then calculated out which selection of cheese based on my budget would get me the best bang for my buck and the most yumminess, okay? So if I did this, this is not a greedy algorithm because I examined everything before I made a choice. Here, I look at what I'm currently examining based on the choices that I can make at that time. And I always make that and I commit to it. So does that clarify a little bit of the difference between just any old algorithm and a greedy algorithm? So it's a very simple structure. You're just going to repeatedly apply this selection criterion until you end up with a feasible solution. Okay, so if we're good with that, I must stress one other detail. Oftentimes with the different problems that we're going to look at, they may have underlying structure to them that allow you to design certain kinds of algorithms that aren't just greedy algorithms. Uh, for example, both of those problems I described, the minimum spanning tree problem and the single source shortest path problem have something called optimal substructure. Just remember when I talked about Dijkstra's, I told you that, oh, a shortest path tree consists of shortest path trees. Just like in the minimum spanning tree problem, a minimum spanning tree consists of minimum spanning trees. Um, often when you design these types of algorithms, you try to take advantage of properties like these. But that's often very common. But for pro certain problems like the one we're going to see here, we don't necessarily need to go that far. We're just going to be seeing, okay, here's some idea. We're going to show that this selection criterion is going to be the best one we pick every single time. So I want to talk a little bit about different kind of problem that we have not talked about yet in this course. It's called a packing problem. So I'm going to talk about another example of a greedy algorithm. I'm going to examine a problem called the fractional knapsack problem. Now, before I do that, I need to talk a little bit about packing problems, and I'll give you an example of one. Because ours is going to be based on a classic packing problem. So a packing problem is quite simple. So imagine you have a bunch of objects, and you have some container, or even multiple containers. Depending on how you're optimizing, you may only have a certain number of these. And your job is just to put the objects into the containers, subject to some other set of constraints. But usually the goal is to optimize based on this packing. So there's going to often be rules for the packing. Uh, most one of the classic types of packing problems is so-called the 0-1 knapsack problem. So here's the idea. So suppose I have a bag like this. And I want to go and get a bunch of fun items to put in my knapsack. Suppose I'm a little mischievous, and this is after Halloween, for example, and I want to get some candy. Say there's some leftover candy, and I want to take advantage of the fact that I can put them in this knapsack. My apologies for the little noise there. But um, so suppose I have a bunch of candy like this. Like say, I have a couple chocolate bars here. I got a smaller one, and I have a whole bunch I have a whole bunch of these M&Ms. I promise this is not product placement, okay? <laughs> so what, what I would like to do is I would like to put these items into my knapsack so that it doesn't get overfilled. But here's the thing. There's certain chocolate bars that I like versus other ones. So I may tell you that there's some measure of how good these chocolate bars are. So for example, I don't know. I'm not sure how you feel about Snickers bars. Uh, Snickers may be yummy for somebody, but maybe not so much for somebody else. I may have some measure of what we would call profit for each of my chocolate bars or for my M&Ms. These are all going to be candy items. And the idea is that I would like to pack my knapsack so that I don't exceed the capacity of it, what we're going to refer to as a knapsack capacity. So suppose I have N items, and they're given to me as some set I. Now, the way I'm going to be encoding it today is I'm going to assume that each item I has a profit, which is going to be some positive integer, but I must stress that there's versions of this where it doesn't necessarily have to be a positive integer. The same ideas I'm going to tell you here still apply even if you don't have that property. It just make, keeps things simpler. So each item is going to have a profit and a weight. So when I put a chocolate bar into my knapsack, it and contributes a weight to the knapsack. 
Suppose maybe I haven't been working out very often and I can't lift this bag if it gets too heavy. <laughs> we want to make sure we keep in mind the, the weight of an item. So the goal here would just be like, hey, look, I want to get all of these items in here or as many as I can so that I maximize the profit that I can get while it doesn't get too heavy or it doesn't exceed its capacity. So we're going to have items. There's going to be N of them, and there's going to be some nap knapsack capacity, just exactly like I just described here. So knapsack capacity is going to be capital W here. And the way I'm going to encode this information for you is that, that the weight and the profits, they're going to be arrays. And I'm going to index them from 1 to N, just for the sake of simplicity for facts that I'm not going to get into here. So I'm going to assume that the weights and profits are given to you as two arrays. And I'm going to be given this knapsack capacity. And now for each one of the items, I'm going to encode this information for my knapsack of what I'm going to put into the knapsack and what I'm not going to put into the knapsack as a binary variable. The fancy name for, I have some variable I'm going to call xi. This is going to be some position in an array. And it's going to tell me whether I include the item in the knapsack or I don't. So for example, if I have this stickers bar, if I include it in the knapsack, if I put it in the knapsack, and that makes some fun noise. When I put it in the knapsack, that means that I'm going to assign for this item, say that's item, say item two, then it would be that X two is assigned one. What it's going to mean is that if XI is equal to one, it means put I into the knapsack. When it's zero, I don't put it into the knapsack. So what we're going to do is we compute a knapsack. It's going to be some subset of the items. That's what this means. It's I prime is some subset of I. And I'm going to represent this as an, an array of length N called X. And it's going to store in here zeros and ones that tell me which items to put in and which ones not to put in. And the goal, there's two, there's two, actually three, technically three things you need to keep in mind is that we would like to maximize the total profit that we get. So this is just the sum of all of the profits over each of the items that I put into the knapsack. That's what the, all this is saying. It's just the sum over all of the items and I include all of the profits from the items that I include in my knapsack because those values will be all one. All the ones that aren't in the knapsack will all be zero. But here's this knapsack capacity in play is that it's subject to the following, that the sum of all of my weights of items I put in cannot exceed the weight of the knapsack. But here's another constraint. It's sort of implicit in the way I've described it to you. This is going to be the one that's going to matter for us today, is that in the zero one knapsack problem, each one of these XI values, either I include the, na the na item in the knapsack or I don't. I include the Snickers or I don't include the Snickers. I include the M&Ms. I don't include the M&Ms. That's the constraint on the zero and knapsack problem that we're going to be we're going to be kind of waving along. So I must stress that the zero and knapsack problem is a hard problem to solve to optimality in an exact way. Uh, we will talk more about this later on in the course. In fact, we'll study an algorithm specifically for this problem. Now I'm going to shift gears. So first, does everybody understand the idea of the zero and knapsack problem? So I have n items, I put them in the knapsack or I don't put them in the knapsack. My goal is to make sure I don't put too much into my knapsack so it doesn't get too heavy. And that heaviness is determined by the knapsack capacity. And my goal is to maximize the profit. So this is what we call a maximization problem. So does the size of the item matter or is it just in and out? So whenever I put an item in, it adds weight to the knapsack. So that's the way it's going to matter. So if I put it into the knapsack, if I put the Snickers bar in, or I put the M&Ms into the knapsack, this will introduce more weight to the, the total weight of the knapsack. Uh, <laughs> but yes, yes. <laughs> but, but yes, so <laughs> take, take. take all the iPhones, skip the TP. <laughs> but yeah, another way you can cast this is that if you want to think about trying to maximize the amount of stuff that you could put into a bag, that's very much what this is. 
So like I said, this problem is actually much harder than the one we're going to study today. What we're going to study instead is what we're going to refer to as the fractional knapsack problem. So in the zero one knapsack problem, we either include an item or we don't. As the name suggests, the fractional knapsack problem is where we're going to include, we, can, we allow you to include part of an item as opposed to a whole item. That's gonna be the big difference between these two problems. So let me define this for us. So, so my apologies, my apologies. By the way, this will all be in the notes, so please, uh, please uh, take note of that. So let me just describe the fractional knapsack problem. So here's the, so we're going to talk about, today we're focusing in on the fractional knapsack problem. So the zero one knapsack problem, that was just for me to set this up. So we will talk about zero one knapsack later in the course, but we will be focusing today on this problem. So here's the plain way I could describe this to you. Uh, it is defined same as zero one knapsack except except our knapsack except our knapsack allows xi to be a fractional value, a fractional value between zero and one. So what I'm really telling you is that, to be a bit more precise, I'm saying that each xi is on the interval zero and one. So for those that what some clarification of what this means. That just simply means it's no different than me writing that xi is between zero and one inclusively for each one of my items. So just to come back to my example here. So in zero one knapsack, I had to take this whole chocolate bar or I didn't, right? Here's the difference now. What I'm allowed to do is say, for example, I consider these M&Ms. I could, now in zero knapsack, I would have to either include this or not include it. What I can do now is I can, uh, say for example, I only want to take a part of my M&Ms. By the way, clean out your bags if you put candy in them. I may or may not. <laughs> so say for example, I want to put half, say half of this M&Ms in my knapsack. I'm allowed to do that. But it's even more relaxed than that. Suppose that these M&Ms, see these little small M&Ms in here. These M&Ms, suppose I can make these M&Ms infinitely divisible. Meaning that I can take as small of a piece as I like of this M&M. Say I could go with like a, a microscope and just like take a little piece out of this M&M and I can include that in the knapsack. So that's what I'm saying here when I'm relaxing the problem a little bit. In technical terms, this is what we call relaxation, but we're, all we're going to worry about is that this is the constraint that we're going to have on those items. Otherwise, the problem is formulated the exact same way. So each one of our items, so just in plain language, in plain language, each item can be broken now, obviously, don't break the item, but you want to take care of them. <laughs> but say if you can't, hypothetically speaking, <laughs> broken into a smaller piece. Given by Xi. Where? 
vertex i is between 0 and 1. And our goal, of course, is to maximize. We're going to maximize the total profit. So that's what we're going to be doing. Does everybody understand what the fractional knapsack problem is? Because this is what we're going to be studying for the remainder of this lecture. And you might be looking at the time and be like, Dan, woo. Um, don't worry. Like I said, greedy algorithms are very simple. I'll be including the pseudocode in the notes if you're curious. So let me just do an example, just so we're clear. So suppose I give you where the knapsack capacity W is, say, 25, just as an example. And suppose I give the items to you like this. So suppose I have, oh, let's write another row. So I have my items I. I'm going to have four items. So I'm going to have four items. Each of the profits are going to be read as follows. They're going to be 36, 10, 20, and 2. And the weights of each item is going to be 24, 10, 4, and 1. So when I look at these four items, there's a lot of different ways I could potentially pack the four items into the knapsack. Now, if you look at all these weights, you should see quite clearly that I can't fit all of the items into the knapsack. I'm going to have to be a bit careful about this. So, so here's a, an example of a feasible solution. Here's a feasible solution. So if I were to use the notation I talked about earlier with the XIs, where I have my array, where each one of the positions represents how much of an item I take, here's a, what a feasible solution would look like. So here's a knapsack, where I have one half, one, one half, one. So what I'm saying here is I take entirely item two, entirely item four, and I take halves of items one and three. That's what this, this means, this array here. So if I were to compute out what the total profit is, this is what it would look like. So I look at each of my profits and I multiply it by each of those xi values, just like I have over here in my sum. That's all I'm doing here. So, so this is what the profit would be. It's 36 times x1 plus 10 times x2 plus 20 times x3 plus 2 times x4. So if I plug in all my x values, this is going to be 36 times 1 half plus 10 times 1 plus 20 times a half, plus two times one. So if you compute this out, you should end up with, I believe, 40. So this would end up being the profit of the knapsack. So this is my total profit. And if I were to compute the total weight of the knapsack, I just simply look at this row and I multiply each of these by the xi values. So just as an example, I would just have 24 times x1 plus 10, let's see, yeah, 24, yeah, 24 times x1, 10 times x2 plus 4 times x3 plus 1 times x4. So this ends up being, being 24 times 1 half plus 10 times 1 plus 4 times a half plus 1 times 1. So if I calculate this out, if I calculate this out, this is going to be exactly equal to 25. So this is the total weight of the knapsack. So the reason why I would say that this is a feasible solution is because notice that I've given you some selection of the items such that it respects the knapsack capacity. Notice that the knapsack capacity is 25. It matches it this time. 
but it's okay if it ends up that the total weight is less than that. So that's why we call this a feasible solution, but we can do better than this. So we can actually do something quite simple. Um, so just as an example, um, let me just write it out and then I'll let you check it. So here's an example of an optimal solution. So here's an optimal solution. You'd use five over six for item one, none of item two, all of item three, and all of item four. And if you're wondering, the total profit of this one, the total profit is gonna end up being 52, and its total weight is also going to be 25. So you can see that we could do much better than our feasible solution here. But does everybody understand the, what a feasible solution is for this problem? Is it just some selection of the items such that I respect the knapsack capacity, meaning that the total weight of my knapsack does not exceed W. So are we okay with this? Just wanna make sure. So give me a thumbs up if we're all good to go. Okay, I see a thumb. But yeah, in the notes I give more details about how this is calculated, by the way. Okay, so if we're good, I wanna talk about the selection criterion and the algorithm for solving this problem. So let's proceed, I'm gonna go over there. So let's proceed over here. So believe it or not, the first thing that you might think of trying actually works in this problem. Um, now there's a lot of different things you could pick for the selection criterion. For example, you could, for example, pick always items with the largest profit first. But if you're being a little bit more clever, you can actually, there's actually something better than that. In fact, I encourage you to try that Yes, somebody pointed out profit per weight. So if you're thinking about this, remember in this problem, I'm allowed to take as much of an item as I like, or I can take a fractional piece of it. So what does that mean? I can think about all of, I could take all of an item. And when I start running out of space, I could take as much of the next item with the most profit per weight. So I could cut up those items if I need to. But if I take the one that's the most valuable, meaning that it has the most profit per weight first, it means it's going to have a very large value for its profit, but it's gonna have presumably not as much weight. So that's gonna be the idea or intuition. Yes, yes, right on the nose, right on the nose, perfect. So just, to give you an idea, so here's the selection criterion that I'd recommend we use. And this actually spells out the entire algorithm, by the way. Select as much, as much of the next, the next highest, value item by profit per weight while respecting the knapsack capacity. So that's exactly it. You can think of it as, for those that are interested in finance, you think of this as profit density. So my goal is if I take a whole bunch of the most valuable item, but like it's like the most as in like, it gives me the most bang for my, 
for how much I put in that knapsack. That is the natural choice to make here. But if you're not convinced by this, uh, let me just do a, actually before I do an example here, I want somebody, can somebody describe to me how I can implement this as an algorithm? And in fact, the first thing you may think of trying to do here is actually what I would recommend. So I already see some suggestions that basically are in the correct direction about how to do this. So remember, all I do is I select as much of the next highest value by profit by weight. So we know how to do, we, we can, like if I give you a bunch of items and I have their profits and weights, how can I know which one is the most profit per weight? Yes, exactly, exactly. So you create a sorted array and what you do is you're just gonna simply index into the positions or you could just literally create a sorted array that is a associative or parallel array for the profits and weights. And then you just go through them from left to right and you start trying to shove them into the knapsack. And when you run out of space in your knapsack for an entire item, you chop up that last piece and you throw it in there. We'll see this with our example. But the point here is that you could, the algorithm for this is exactly what you had suggested. And the way I wrote it, it's gonna be based on an associative array in the notes. So I want you to see the notes just for the pseudo code. But if you describe it in that exact way, what would be the worst case time complexity? So if I sort it first and then I just go through each item and I just say, okay, it, it's, I'm gonna set the XI value and then I'm going to increase my load of how much I have. How long does it take me to do this? Well, you can do it in quadratic time. That's a naive implementation that will work. But believe it or not, you, because you sorted all the elements from largest profit per weight to least, and you just simply go through each, each one of the items until you run out of space in your knapsack, you're gonna have to in, n iterations of constant amount of work. So you have sorting and then you have this. So we could sort in n log n time. So what would be the worst case time complexity here? By the way, if you're looking for the details about this, it's gonna be in the notes. Um, like I said, this is a very simple algorithm. It's n log n. So you can achieve this running, you can, you can implement this idea as a greedy algorithm um, in big theta n log n time. Just mainly for the purposes of time, I'm not going to include that here, but there's a couple different ways you could describe it. So if you're wondering about its proof of correctness, it uses something called an exchange argument. And the argument goes like this. This is very common for proving the correctness of greedy algorithms. Is suppose for the sake of a contradiction that you assume that your algorithm for some instance doesn't produce an optimal answer. Then what you do is that means that there exists some better answer out there. You don't know what it looks like, but you'd like to find an optimum that looks kind of like the one that your algorithm produces. Then all you're going to do is you're going to go through each one of the items and you're gonna see where your solution and the optimum disagrees. And you can make some assumptions in our proof to do this based on our selection criterion because our optimum always can be ordered in this kind of way. So what you do is you just look for positions that disagree, you swap what you did in the greedy algorithm with the optimum and then what you do is you modify the optimum so that it stays an optimal answer. And every time you do this, you're gonna perform each one of these small modifications. It's gonna be like hot potato where every time you're gonna make a change to the optimum, it's gonna get one step closer to the optimum. So that when you finish doing this, you end up actually with an optimal solution. And what does it mean? Because it actually exactly matches the one the algorithm produces, that this algorithm actually solves the problem. So that's the general gist of this. I'm gonna do one example. I know I have one more minute here. I'm just gonna to try to finish this up for everybody. 
So I'm going to use the same example I had before, but I'm just going to write it this way. So if you have the items on in front of you, if I sort them by profit per weight, I have, I would sort it to be so that the items are listed in by three, four, one, and two. This is gonna, by the way, if you look at the notes, this is gonna end up being my associative array that's gonna index into the positions of the original arrays. You could do this a different way by just simply sorting P and W, and then you just add the items into some set. That's another way you could write this algorithm out. If I were to compute the PIs and WIs here, I would end up with five, two, three halves, and one. If you're wondering how you would actually implement this, you would take comparisons based on the profits per weight when you're sorting a list that starts with one, two, three, four, all the way up to n. So you make the comparisons based on this value, which you compute from our input arrays. And then when you have our p's, our p's and w's, let me just write those too, with respect to the readjusted associated array, 22, 36, and 10. 4, 1, 24, and 10. So when we do this, here's how we do this. So we're just going to put in, so you put in item 3 as a whole. This means that x at this time is going to be 0, 0, 1, 0. And we're going to have some variable we're going to call the load. So if you look at the weight of item three, its, uh, it's load is going to be four here. So the load currently would be four. And the goal is that I want to make sure the load doesn't exceed W. So when I do this, I can keep going along here. So I consider three. I still have room in my knapsack to fit the next item. So we'll put in item four. as a whole, so that means that x is going to be 0, 0, 1, 1. And if you look at the load here, it would be 4 plus the weight of this, so that makes it 5. Load is 5. And then what you do is you just proceed a little bit further here. So let me just wrap this up here. So notice that item 3 doesn't actually fit entirely. Notice that it's, its weight is 24, that's way too much. So what you do is you actually would compute this out as the knapsack capacity minus the load divided by whatever the weight is for that item using this associative array. So if you compute this out, you'll end up at, it's actually gonna compute about 5 sixths of item one. Put in five six of item one. Of item one. And if you, I'll ask you just to check this, that it does in fact meet the knapsack capacity of 25. And when you have your solution X, you'll end up with five, six, zero, one, one. And you'll notice that this actually matches up exactly with the one I mentioned earlier. So anyways, when we come back next time, we're going to start talking about what are called divide and conquer algorithms and some mathematical tools we're going to need for that. So um, I apologize for the extra time needed to cover this. I wanted to make sure that you've seen this. It's very important. So I say thank you very much. Uh, actually, let me see. Item one, position three. Yes, yeah, position three. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you, yes, yes, Mike. That is absolutely correct. So yeah, when I said it earlier, this is supposed to be item one. Thank you, thank you. And that's position three. Yes, 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 the, sor the sorting is the bottleneck of this algorithm. Yeah, hey, no worries, no, thank you very much. In fact, if you already knew it was sorted in advance, you could do this in linear time, but no. I want to say thank you very much, everybody. I can stick around for any questions after. And have yourself a beautiful day. I'll see you later.